So hello, bonjour, and thank you for joining this session of the McGill Executive Institute's Level Up webinar series. My name is Eric Sane, Director of the Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you. This session is going to last one hour and include time to answer your questions. Although you'll be on mute during the main session, you can submit your questions by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Also, for better viewing, we recommend that you stop the video image of yourself by clicking on Stop Video to the lower left. This session is going to be recorded and will be shared with you afterwards. We're very proud to welcome your webinar leaders for today, Ben Beauregard and Claude McDonald. They are faculty members of the McGill Executive Institute and specialists in B2B marketing and sales. Pam Sorrenti, our Director of Public Programs, will be moderating today's session. She's a learning advisor and specialist in creating impactful seminars. So thanks again for joining. And with that, let's get started. Over to you, Ben. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you all for uh, making the time. Um, we know that your time is precious. Both uh, Claude and I appreciate that. Uh, very much. So um, to kickstart everything, uh, I'd like to, um, to start by having everybody participate. So in the chat box, I'd love to hear from you. I see that we're uh, already getting a lot of uh, messages saying hi. Mm -hmm. I would like to know um, what you guys would like uh, to get out of this training. Uh, so we can uh, kickstart that and Pam, uh, I'll let you. Uh, yeah, definitely. We'll wait. Just give it a second. Absolutely. So let us know. Let us know what you would like to learn. If uh, uh, there's things that uh, that you want there. All right. So we got some best practices, sales strategies. We have a hello from the Montreal Alouette sales team. So that's awesome. that's awesome. Right. Uh, something new to change in our behavior. A digital sales strategy. Some good ideas. How to close a deal. Negotiations. Best practices for a new cold sales conversation. Oh. Storytelling your specialty then negotiations um, all right hey wonderful building pipelines hey well you know what you're at the right place <laughs> um and the way to build um this presentation both claude and i decided to build this based on principles um that will that are evergreen that will last uh, no matter the uh, economic situation no matter the COVID situation um We've built and uh, we've built it in a way that uh, it's it's it lasts uh, with during time, and so um, in order to do this, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we wanted to bring in the presentation, and so to do this, we wanted to have a rapid fire style training. So this means remove your distractions, go full screen, and get ready to interact. Um, so let's get right into it. Act in business like you would act in a romantic relationship. Uh, why is that? Well, you wouldn't propose baby names on a first date, right? That's weird, it's crazy, nobody does that. However, what's even weirder is that we see that in a sales context uh, over and over again. We see marketers do that and we see salespeople do that. Uh, people are starting to talk about yourself and your product at the very beginning of a sales conversation. Um, tip number one, be a good, uh, a good human, you know, start, especially, this is especially true right now in this, in this time, make sure you connect with the other person that you're talking to, um, ask, uh, about their family, at least show that you have, uh, an interest. So, uh, there you go. Um, what you want to do then is reverse, let's reverse engineer the perfect client, um, in order reverse engineer the, the perfect uh, romantic relationship. So how do you do that? Well, first you go on a first date. Uh, that's kind of like the equivalent of qualifying your client. Then you move on to um, your official relationship. You know, you make it official with them. You make it official with other people. Uh, you introduce your new partner to families uh, and friends. And then uh, possibly uh, you might want to move in together then uh, you possibly make the decision of making them uh, your life partner and having kids. And so my question to you is, 
why do we go through all this motions? You know, yeah, it's not, it's not regular behavior in a sense, because if you look at animals, they take about 10 seconds to decide to make kids together. Uh, so why is it that we take years and years to actually get to that point? Uh, again, I would like to, to get um, your ideas on the chat. Uh, what is it that we're looking for? What do we want to know in order to uh, make the decision of having a life partner or possibly even doing kids? All right. So we want to know we can trust the other person. A lot of trust and credibility here, Ben. Um, are we a good fit? All really valid things. Values, how compatible are we? Uh, help in surviving chemistry, compatibility, mutual trust, um, fulfill unmet needs, shared values. <laughs> Can you get out before it's too late? Um, <laughs> um, referrals are like arranged marriages? Question mark. Well, so that's, that's a great point, right? I mean, this is, this is the standard in Western uh, civilization. It's not necessarily the standard everywhere, but for the sake of this argument, for the sake of, of uh, our analogy, we're going to say uh, we're going to keep that, that framework as is. But all of these are great, um, uh, great, uh, great points. And it's essentially, I mean, from my perspective, uh, we want to know how their personality is like. We want to know what their interest is like. We want to know about their character, what their values, the fit with friends and family. So how does that relate back to a sales context? Well, reverse engineer your perfect client now. So who are they? You know, what are the demographics, uh, the psychographics? What are the, uh, the market segments? And, um, you know, it happens a lot. Uh, the, the clearer you are on who it is that you want to be talking to, the easier it's going to be to recognize them once you see them. Wouldn't that be nice, right? Be able to recognize the perfect client the moment you see them. Now, um, a lot of people, uh, I'm in B2B, I have been for over 10 years, and I hear a lot of people, oh, I don't necessarily need to know uh, the psychographics, demographics, because I'm in B2B. Well, I'd like to share my, uh, my opinion on that, and it's that, Whatever you are, you know, if you do B2B, B2C, uh, B2E, B2G, b 2 whatever, we're all essentially in H to H. Uh, it's we're all in human to human. Uh, and, and the sooner you get that, the easier it is going to be to get your sales uh, and marketing to the next level. Now, uh, that's who they are. The other thing you want to know is what do they want? What are they after? And that's not to be confused with what they need because people, people don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. Um, and it's, it, that's why people continue smoking even after being diagnosed with lung cancer. It's, it's terrible, but it happens all the time. That's why even, you, even if you know that you need to lose weight, you keep eating that ice cream. It's not because you need the ice cream. It's because you want it. And, and, you know, it's, uh, that's, that's unfortunately how it works. Now, why do they want it? That's another uh, very uh, key component because uh, the moment you know why people want something, that, that's the moment you're able to differentiate yourself and, and really make it about them. More on that later. Uh, the other point that you want to do, uh, you want to touch on is what does success look like for them, for your perfect client. That's essentially one level deeper than why they want it. And it's really important because that's essentially the ideal outcome uh, from your perfect client's perspective. And that is a key component on a compelling story. And again, more on that later. So once you can recognize your perfect client, uh, now you need to qualify. And somebody was talking about uh, sales best, uh, best practices. Well, one, that's absolutely part of it. Do you, do, does your uh, perfect client have the budget available? That's a conversation you need to have, or that's an information you need to have prior to your sales conversation. And uh, no sense in investing sales effort with prospects if they don't have the budget. Uh, these prospects need more marketing, not sales. Uh, so again, do they have a sense of urgency? Uh, you know, what you want to know is, uh, 
and it's paradoxical, but people buy what they want, but they only buy it once they need it. And that's, um, it's, it's paradoxical, but uh, if you think about it, uh, Dr. Cialdini, for the people that read uh, Influence, it's possibly one of the best marketing and sales book that was ever written, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, Dr. Cialdini refers to scarcity. So, you know, back, back in the old days when we'd be able to go shopping in, in, in malls, uh, you could get into a, um, into a store, see a, a shirt that you like a lot, and not buy it. Uh, you want it, you think it's, it's really nice, but you don't necessarily buy it. The moment you realize that it's the very last shirt that the, uh, that the shop has, and it, and it happens to fit you, then all of a sudden there's scarcity. Because if you don't buy it now, you might never have it. And so that scarcity makes you, makes you buy it. So uh, although we buy only what we want, we only buy it when we need it. So that's a, a little um, caveat there. Do they have a realistic timeline? So what does that uh, look like for, for you? Uh, you know, in other words, what's your timeline sweet spot as a, a company? Uh, you know, if your agenda is wide open, well, a very, very uh, short timeline for uh, purchasing whatever it is that, you, that, uh, that you're selling it's fantastic because all of a sudden your ability to deliver on a short timeline becomes what part of your unique selling proposition. If uh, your client has a, if, if your agenda is already packed, well then a, a longer timeline is going to be necessary. So uh, in order to craft your perfect client, you need to know where your timeline sweet spot lies. Then obviously, are you talking to the decision maker? Uh, if the person that you're talking to can't actually make the decision of buying at the end, you want to make sure that the rainmaker is part of the conversation uh, once you uh, once you enter the sales conversation. So, uh, sales and marketing; those are all sales and marketing best practices, and they're good, but they're not good enough in a sense that they won't systematically create the perfect sales conversation. Uh, to create the perfect sales conversation, we need to shift gears. Now, I need to know, are you ready to shift gears? I can't really see you, but I'm kind of hopefully imagining you fist pumping the air and saying, let's go. So let me know if, if <laughs> there you go. They are, uh, they are. It's all good. Yeah, they <laughs> are ready. ready. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, all right. We've got you. That's perfect. In a perfect sales conversation, you might want your prospects too. And I'm going to go on a limb here because I don't know all of your sales processes, but I'm guessing you, you want your perfect client to be happy to be talking with you. Uh, nobody likes to be talking with Mr. Scrooge uh, for an hour. And do you have enough time? They have enough time blocked off for your meeting. Uh, you know, that might vary uh, a lot. It's uh, 15 minutes, maybe it's an hour, maybe it's two hours, but uh, it's important to have enough uh, time to, be, to actually go through the motion. Um, they have a value first mindset. Uh, so what's a value first mindset? Well, a, a good way to, um, a good way to break, to, uh, to, to talk about the value first mindset is talk about the exact opposite, which is a cost first mindset. So in the mind of a prospect, the cost first, cost first mindset essentially means that all of the services are created equal. Therefore I will make a decision based on price. If a prospect comes into a sales conversation and has a value first mindset, they see a wide array of benefits depending on the different services that you're offering. Therefore, they make a decision based on the value to cost ratio, which is very different um, and en enables you to have a, a deeper, more meaningful sales conversation. The other part of uh, the perfect sales conversation would be uh, engaging with what makes you and your offer different. So they're able to recognize your unique selling proposition or possibly saying your unique value proposition and, uh, and they wanna talk about it. That's the perfect sales conversation. At least it's, it's part of mine. So um, I'd love to hear again from, from you guys if you have other um, aspects that you feel should be uh, in this. Uh, these are some of it, but essentially the perfect sales conversation, there's as many elements as there are sales processes. 
So uh, if you have uh, a couple of ideas, I'd love to, to hear what you have to say. Maybe while we're waiting for, uh, for some of these ideas, then um, there's a question here about most likely after the pandemic, there won't be, you know, so many face-to-face -face meetings. So, you know, suggestions on, on virtual uh, conversations. All of this, all of this uh, applies 100% on virtual conversations. And, um, you know, even the way that we want to go, uh, we're actually going to go uh, dig deeper in all of the examples for uh, those specific elements. Um, uh, make sure you are in a listening mindset. Absolutely. That's a second part of this, converse, of this uh, presentation. We're going to go right into that. Mm -hmm. um, so how, oh, perfect. So how do we create... Uh, happiness and excitement inside, even uh, within a, a sales conversation, with, even within confinement. Um, well, the secret to creating happiness and excitement in the sales conversation is attention. Now, uh, attention, take two minutes, for example, to flip your phone up and make a personalized vi video prior to the meeting saying it could be uh, super simple by saying, uh, you know, I'm excited to be uh, meeting with you. I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to sharing something, some insightful piece of information I know about your market. Um, I'm, it, it could be very, very uh, simple, but at least know that's how you create, it's by reciprocity, you create happiness, excitement by your, you yourself being ha happy and excited to meet the other person. The secret, to having um, enough dedicated time is appreciation. I know, because I'm in the middle of a... Of a... Okay, <laughs> so the, the, the secret uh, to having enough dedicated time is appreciation, and I mean appreciation in both sense of the term. So when we talk about appreciation, obviously we want to thank the other person for making the time. You're, you're, you're grateful, you want to verbalize that. But appreciation also means gaining in value, like the appreciation of the Canadian, uh, Canadian dollar, for example. Uh, so you need to be able to provide a return on investment or return on time for your, for your client or your prospect. If your, pro your prospect is deciding to spend uh, time with you, they're also they also decided not to spend their time elsewhere. And there's, there's a cost to that. So that you need to make sure it's your responsibility now to make sure that you have a great return on investment on the time that they decided to invest in you. And you do that throughout the whole, uh, all of your marketing, you do that on your website, you do that on all the communications prior to the sales conversation in order to lay the foundation. So when they are uh, speaking with you, they, uh, they feel like they, their time and their value is appreciated. appreciated. So secret of value first mindset, edutainment, edutainment. Yeah. Education and entertainment put in together. You know, that could be through form of video and emails secret to an engaging, unique selling proposition, storytelling. And I'll give you a hint right now. The story is not about you. You're not the, the hero of the story. The hero of your story should be your client. So where does that leave you? Well, we're going to go, go uh, right into that um, right now. So how do you craft a compelling story? Well, um, I'm about to give you the Hollywood formula. Uh, you're probably not going to win an Oscar tomorrow, but at least you're going to be able to apply it to uh, your business, uh, to your marketing, and to your sales. And so uh, the formula is as follows. A hero has a villain. A villain a hero meets an unlikely ally. The ally provides the missing piece of a puzzle. The hero beats the villain and wins. Now, we're going to put this formula to test and, and to better um, help you understand it and internalize the, this formula, I decided to take two very distinct uh, films that for you definitely heard of these, uh, these made billions of dollars. Um, and they're two on the surface level, two very, very different, uh, movies. But when you look at the story structure, the, they're exactly identical. We're going to talk about the lion King and we are going to talk about star Wars. So in the lion King, we have Simba, a young lion prince who has a villain scar, uh, and the, the scar 
uh, unfortunately kills uh, Simba's. And I'm sorry if I'm spoiling, but if, uh, I mean, it's been out for about 30 years. It's about time you've seen it. Uh, so uh, Scar uh, unfortunately kills Simba's father and then chases him out of this kingdom. Uh, then Simba makes an unlikely ally in Timon, Pumbaa, and Rafiki. Rafiki shows Simba he's fit to be king. And then Simba comes back to the kingdom, defeats Scar, and fulfills his destiny and becomes the benevolent king that his father once was. Same exact, exact structure. Same thing for Star Wars. Luke Skywalker has Darth Vader who wants to destroy, destroy his planet. Now, he makes an unlikely ally in Yoda. Yoda teaches Luke the secret Jedi powers, and then Luke becomes a Jedi by defeating the evil empire. Now, um, as you can see, it's two very different stories with the exact same structure. So how does that apply to your business? Well, it's the exact same thing. Your perfect client has a problem. He, they make an unlikely ally in yourself and your company. You give them a way to overcome their problem and they live their definition of success. Uh, the, and that's why we need to lay the groundwork as we, we've already identified what that uh, looks like. So if you've done the first parts of uh, the conversation uh, and you've really discovered who your perfect client is, then uh, you're able to provide uh, the business story. You have all the elements and ingredients to create a great business story. So without further ado, uh, I'm handing the ball to my very good friend, Claude McDonald. So Claude, up to you, my friend. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, now, uh, Ben just uh, showed to us uh, how to tee up a sales conversation. In other words, there's, if you look at the, the customer's buying path, there's actually five steps, right? Um, so awareness where uh, people are, they, they know, they know uh, um, th that they, uh, there is something out there that may be, that may be interesting. And the second step is that, uh, you know, they start poking around and uh, see what appeals to them. And then they get interested. In, so, so I know. And then and the second piece is the result is, uh, oh, I, I like this. And then they start asking, poking around, um, and they start asking their friends, uh, uh, and eventually asking um, partners uh, to, uh, to see what kind of solutions they may have. And if all goes well, then they take action. And, um, and if it goes well again, uh, they may advocate for you and, uh, or, or they advocate against you. So there's, there's a front end here of teeing up the conversation where Ben gave you a, a very good framework to, to articulate the story uh, that you need, that your, your, your prospects need, uh, and obviously your clients need to be in contact with uh, so that you can engage them in the conversation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a few things here to make sure that when you engage them, you create a meaningful conversation when you're in contact with them. So earlier we had people uh, asking, so how do we do it uh, virtual? So obviously um, my own practice, Ben's practice, uh, McGill, we all had to convert like many of you to, uh, to di digital. So now um, lots of Zoom calls, right? Lots of face-to-face, -face, but uh, and let's stay away from the phone. It's uh, we're missing a, a a big piece here. So let's see uh, how we engage people in a meaningful conversation. Now, all this process is meant for one thing, right? It's uh, um, uh, actually two things. It's meant to engender this. So uh, in the chat box, what I'd like you to do here is just write a word that uh, that comes to your mind when you see this picture. What does that mean to you? The gravity. Gravity. <laughs> That's a good one. I like it. Gravity. Faith support, and trust. trust <laughs> yes, trust, uh, support, absolutely. So the word, obviously, that I was looking for is trust. The whole process from aware to advocate is what? Is to make sure that we build trust for to with, with every prospect and customer. And the other piece is also to create uh, a lot of what, when you see this pearl in the middle of a shell, what do you think? A lot of, 
opportunity, value, absolutely. So value is the right word here. So trust and value at the end of the day are the two things that customers really buy. So when you look at it from the customer's perspective, that's what they buy. Uh, and uh, there's a basic principle when you sell, and I hope you never forget this after today. Maybe you already know this, but uh, the principle is this, is the brain that's doing the thinking and the talking in the conversation is the brain that is getting the most value. I, I repeat, the brain that's doing most of the talking and the thinking is the one getting the most value. So in other words, what I'm telling you is when you and the people contributing, uh, you, your, your colleagues, the people contributing to the sales process are in this mode. I did this, we are the best at this, our solutions are this, so, and we do this by doing this and blah, 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 blah. Ben said it to you earlier, and I insist, you are not the hero of your story. And you need, and what we need to do is, is have a conversation that is, that is not about you. It, it, it has to be about them, right? So how do we do this? Well, first of all, we stop doing this. So if you can, if you, if, if one, if, if one thing you get away from this webinar is, hey, let's stop doing this, we're doing, and I challenge you guys, uh, go into your website, your tech sheets, your, all the documents that you give to your customers and count the number of I's, of we's, of ours, us, uh, it, it's flabbergasting, right? Uh, we need to twist that around. So all in the marketing material, as well as in the sales conversation. So let's stop doing this. So if we stop doing this, what are, what are some strategies? Obviously we have a webinar here of one hour and what we want to do is, focus, I could have gone on into 10 strategies, but I'm just going to focus on two here that I think would be very valuable for all of you. So the first one is having better insight into a client's business model. And I'm going to show you a very, very uh, efficient way of doing this. Why? Because if you have insight into their business model, you, um, you have insight into better insight into how you can create value for them. And the second piece is how they define value um, and, and having the customer articulate how they define value. Uh, so I'll walk you through a very simple um, and effective way of doing both. So the first piece is about understanding the client's business model. Many of you must have seen this, um, this model. It's called the business canvassing model. And uh, it was uh, put together by uh, two gentlemen called Osterwalder and another one called Pina. So I did not invent this. Uh, and a lot of companies are using it to rethink their, their own business model. But uh, being, uh, being specialized in, in, uh, in sales, B2B sales, um, I gave it a, a sales twist. So the idea here is to be able to uncover how a customer generates revenue. So what, who are they selling to, the client segments? Uh, what is their value proposition? I'll go more into you know. Uh, what kind, how do they bring their value proposition to the market uh, through channels? And what kind of relationships are they trying to build uh, as they're doing that? And what are their revenue streams? So that's how they generate revenue. And the other piece is how they, they incur costs, right? Through vendors that they work with, alliances, uh, some key activities, assets, and, and there's a cost structure that, that uh, surrounds this. So, um, so in essence, what I'm going to show you now is a tool that I've designed that for, for my own team and, uh, and for my clients as well. And many of them have tried it with quite a bit of success. And we're going to play around with this if you're, if you're willing to play the game. So the first piece is, um, so as you can see, it's, uh, there's, one, there's a sequence here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's the sequence that I suggest uh, to most people who want to use this to uncover a business model. Now you can, you can uh, easily um, access information, maybe fill in a few blanks before you meet with the customer, uh, and then you confirm or infirm a few things. But the idea is you go in that sequence. And uh, what I'd like you guys to do is to kind of try it and see how it feels. So we're going to give you seven to 10 minutes just to, to feel it out, all right? So I'm going to uh, expose to you the types of questions 
that are in each box. I'm not going to go into the, 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 the detail of each question, but that's the kind of questions that uh, you can ask a customer to uncover their business model. And when once you have done it, you've got better insight into how they operate. Now, the thing is, is I ch and, and the challenge is this, is I challenge you and many of, the, of the, your colleagues to do this kind of exercise for the top five clients that you have. And I'll bet you a lot of money that, um, that there would be a lot of blank spots and a lot of assumptions. So let's play around with this. And uh, by the way, there's a camera right here. What I'd like you to do is take your phone and take a little, like a picture of this so that we can use it in the breakout rooms um, uh, that we're gonna go into in about 30 seconds, all right? So take, grab your phone, take a picture of this slide, just so you have the questions ready and uh, to use in the chat rooms, in the breakout rooms, and then we're gonna move on, all right? So another five seconds, four, three, two, one. All right, let's do it. So the breakout exercise is this. I'm gonna put you, uh, actually Pam is gonna put you in, in a few seconds into breakout rooms, and there's gonna be three roles. So one is the buyer, one is the seller, and the other ones who are not the buyer and the seller, and you guys decide, obviously, there's over 50 chat rooms here. Um, and uh, so the seller, so the, the, the seller will ask questions. And so what I want you to do is focus on only the five boxes. One, two, don't do the nine, it's gonna to be too long, right? So do one through five or one through th three. It doesn't matter how many you cover. But the idea, we're gonna give you five, six minutes to, to, do, uh, to try to go through the five. And the buyer, just simply talk about your own company as if you were the client, right? And the observers, what I want you to pay attention to is the quality of questions that are being crafted. And, and asked, all right? So uh, Pam, over to you. Uh, Bam is gonna give you some, uh, some instructions here on how she's gonna proceed with the breakout rooms and then we'll leave you the time to, uh, to think. All right. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms. You're gonna get a little pop-up if you wanna join with your video. Once the pop-up appears, just go ahead and start your video. If you don't wanna use your video, no big deal. Uh, you can still participate. Um, definitely unmute yourself so you can, you can uh, speak though. Um, identify one person in your group who will be the seller and one person who's going to be the buyer. And then spend about two minutes asking questions. I've shared the, uh, the sales conversation tool that uh, Claude was just talking about in the chat a few times now. So hopefully you guys can access it there or you've taken a picture of it. Um, so debrief for about two minutes and then if there's time switch roles, it'll depend on the size of your room, but I'll send messages through. Uh, we'll call you back to the session. Just a reminder to please uh, shut your video off and mute yourself. Um, and then one person from each group can share their thoughts in, uh, the, in the chat. That'd be great. So. So welcome everyone back everyone. Back. Yes. Is everyone, can we just confirm in the chat that everyone's back? Just say yes, good to go. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Right, yeah, cool. we're good. So uh, quickly, um, uh, one or two takeaways from this uh, quick exercise, uh, one or two words uh, um, uh, from, right. from you guys. What, what, what did you, what is a takeaway from what you just did? Uh, again, one or two words. Details, details. details. Yeah. Smooth flow. Um, let's see. Dead air. <laughs> Great tool to orient myself to the client. I talk too much. So that's a, it's always a good one. Uh, let the customer talk. Process is same, whatever industry. Uh, nice to see sharing role play. Uh, question here. Would these questions be answered over time as part of the relationship building? That's a very good question. Actually, it's a, it's a, you, you can uh, fill, out, fill in the blanks over two, three, four meetings, you know, and uh, uh, the, 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 it might get, you, you know, some our organizations are very complex and there might be, a, you know, the business model is not easy to understand. So, yeah, it's not only a one meeting thing that you do. Good point. All right, so, uh, so that's the first part, guys. It's uh, uh, having the customer tell you what their business model is and uh, you understand it from the client's perspective. Then the second piece of what I want to share with you today is to have the customer articulate 
the value they are seeking from you, but in their own words, right? And I want to show you here uh, a principle called the, the CDV triangle, all right? So the CDV triangle is composed of, of uh, three components. The first one is revenue generation. The second one is cost. And the third one is intangible contribution. So whatever the customer, uh, now that you have better insight into their business model, remember there's a revenue side to their business model. There's a cost side to their business model. And whatever we can't put a dollar sign to, well, it becomes an intangible. So what you want to do is craft enough good questions after you've understood the model to figure out the value that they seek from you, but in their own words. So they might be looking for, I don't know, they want to improve their own value proposition. They want to be able to solve more problems for their own client. They want to access new market segments. They want to attract new customers. They want to add or subtract revenue streams uh, or modify them. The idea is you, what you want to do is ask enough questions so that you uh, open ended questions, obviously, to have the customer express what they mean by uh, we want to make more money, right? Um, and you look at the components of the business model and you can ask additional questions and, and have them define the value. That's for revenue generation. As far as, as cost is concerned, they may say, well, you know, uh, it's productivity, it's efficiency, it's the lead times, it's the downtime that we're really, just give you an example. I was with a salesperson uh, doing field work a few months ago. Uh, at the time where we were still meeting um, uh, face to face and uh, we we're made the meeting with the maintenance manager and I am sitting with a salesperson who's unfortunately only talking about uh, the, the products and uh, they happen to sell, for instance, nozzles uh, to um, on production lines. So, uh, the, the, the maintenance manager says, hey, listen, he says, you know, we're having a big problem with the nozzles. And instead of, 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 of uh, and he was opening the door, right, to, uh, so, uh, and instead of uh, picking that up, the salesperson start continued to talk about products. So I couldn't resist. And I asked, I said, what's the problem? And we figured out it was a huge problem. They, were, they had to clean those things and it was causing downtime and more maintenance costs and so forth. And it was, all, it was almost 50 grand of cost, so um, a year uh, for them. So it's really important that you, are, you make. And so I was not a salesperson in that company and I was able to make the customer articulate that. So my point here is I'm not great. It's not that I'm great, is that it's just a process. It's just um, uh, you making the customer articulate value from their perspective. And, and intangible, it can be uh, linked to uh, stuff like customer sat, um, overall vibe in the office, the employee growth. And, and some of these things can be translated into money sometimes, even, you know, health and safety, uh, 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 risk um, can be sometimes transferred into money. But quick list here of how customers could articulate value from their point of view. So my point here is this, is make sure that um, you craft, you know, there's a difference between asking questions and crafting questions and crafting questions is very intentional. So you craft your questions and I call them the value definition questions. That were the questions that will allow the customer to define the value. And you use the answers that you get from the customer to deep dive and go a bit deeper. And you figure out how the client defines value they are seeking from you, not how you, most, you know, you ask most organizations, most people in sales, what do you guys do? They start talking about their own products. They don't talk about the problems that they solve for customers and the value that they bring for customers from their perspective. So my whole point here is this, is first, 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 start understanding the value from the client's perspective, not yours. You are not the hero of the story. I will repeat what Ben said, but you're not. Um, and we take Star Wars, for those of you who know Star Wars, most of us are like Yodas or Obi-Wan Kenobi. We're not, we're not Luke Skywalker, right? Um, and, and then, and only then, can you connect the dots with your solutions and go, oh, Mr. or Mrs. Client, um, you told us that the value you're seeking is this and this and that. Well, here's what we recommend for that. And you're able to connect the dots. But one of the things is, there's, there's one thing that is absolutely sure. 
is that if you don't do what I suggest you do here, i.e. understand the business model, second, understand the value as the customer defines it, what are you stuck with when, you, when you're uh, with your product? You're stuck with a product and a price or a service and a price. That's all you're stuck with because you have nothing, nothing to tie it back to, to connect the dots, right? So the conversation automatically deteriorates to a price issue. Now I see in the chat box, a lot of people concerned about price. And we had a quick uh, discussion while the meeting rooms were going on on that. But um, remember, price is an issue when trust and value are absent. And uh, I know some, some, um, some industries are more competitive than others, but I've learned over the years, and some of you may totally be in, uh, you know, not agree with me on this, but price is very often much more of a seller issue than a buyer issue. And if, and just to convince you of that, go to your purchasing manager, go to your purchase agents at the, in your own company and ask them, have you ever fired a vendor? And uh, many of them will say yes. And you ask them why, I'll bet you a lot of money that the first whys are they couldn't deliver on time, they couldn't, uh, they made promises they didn't keep, the service was really bad, and price will probably be the seventh or eighth item uh, on the list, all right? So uh, prices, so, be, so, uh, so, um, so let's put price aside here, I'm talking about creating value so that you can ask for a price. Right? You can justify your price. It's your job. Why are we in the process as human beings? It's to create that value. If we could replace everyone on this call with machines, uh, what's the worth, what's, what's the point of having humans in the sales process? So let's focus on creating that value up front so that we can, we can exchange it for money after. So, and if you don't, by the way, and I'm going to finish with this, if you don't, uh, well, you're going to suffer uh, when, when you present a solution without creating value up front, usually you suffer from, from a big disease, like a really bad disease. And it's not COVID, by the way. It's this. It's the premature selling syndrome. It's the syndrome of salespeople talking about themselves, their products, their services, and having no clue about what the client, uh, what the, the, the client defined value is. And when you have that, uh, any conversation will deteriorate uh, towards a conversation on price. So I hope, I hope Ben and I were able to convey to you some key principles here to um, improve your sales conversation and make sure that next time you are in front of people, you can engage them in the perfect sales conversation. Have fun. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ben and Claude. We're going to have, uh, we have some time for some questions and some have come in throughout the session. So I'll, I'll start with those. Um, I guess this one is for both of you. How do you gauge the receptiveness in time of COVID-19? You don't want to lose the relationship, but you don't want to be perceived as insensitive either. Um, and you don't want to waste people's time. So how do you balance that? Claude, you're muted, just to FYI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I may, um, great article I read a few um, um, few weeks ago called Combating COVID with Common Interests. There is a move, and many of you probably have noticed, uh, because of COVID, because of this crisis, uh, many, many customers are much more open to cooperation and much more open to um, collaboration. So I would say um, reach out to them, see what happens, but uh, because you're going to be surprised at how if you and and reach out to your existing clients at the moment, and not not necessarily your prospects, because the existing ones are the ones that are going to all they already trust you, they also they already see the value in you, and they're mm -hmm. as Ben said, they're already teed up <laughs> to have this great sales conversation. I, so I agree. That's where I would focus first. I agree. I think, um, you know, it's, you don't want to be insensitive to COVID-19, but uh, truth be told, there's a, a world outside of COVID-19. And sometimes it's also refreshing uh, to, to talk about something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, although you're absolutely you're right, you don't want to be insensitive. And that's why you want to make sure that the families are right, that everything is covered, that everybody uh, is, is, is healthy. Uh, that being said, once you go past that, um, a good sales conversation uh, provides value and, and you create value in your prospect's life.
And Lynn just wrote a, an interesting comment, which is just to reach out, see how they're doing, right? Uh, I've, um, been doing, I, I've been doing that myself, and uh, it, it, that's it. It, it yeah. It's appreciated, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Human beings. <laughs> yeah. Um, ben, <laughs> on a cold call, um, I can see how you can make the, the story strategy work. How far do you go into the steps before you call it quick? Quit, sorry. Turning off potential clients forever. Hmm. Well, you shouldn't necessarily turn them off forever. You just put them in a, in a marketing loop, uh, first of all. But, uh, you know, in a cold call, man, I've done that for a long time. Um, and at the very beginning of, of my career. And truth be told, it you can tell a story inside a sentence if it's well crafted uh so you know what what you need to do is is have a, a two-way conversation so how do you when do you call it quits i'm gonna give um an answer that's unfortunate but it depends uh, right <laughs> if, if we were if we were together Classic. we'd be listening to calls and i could uh give a lot better uh, importance but you know what some people say uh, seven, seven no's. Uh, you know, you haven't really tried until you get seven uh, um, no's. Rejections. <laughs> not, not no's, rejections. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> if, I, if I can add on that uh, uh, very briefly, yeah. and remember one thing, I often say to, my, to everyone that wants to hear it, it's not because something is breathing and has a pulse that it is necessarily a good prospect or a good client. That's so true, right? You want to so, have your, go ahead, I'm sorry, Claude. So ahead. the perfect, and coming back to Ben's point about the perfect client, the clarity you have about that perfect client is, is key. And Ben is a filmmaker. Uh, and um, there's a great, uh, there's, a, there's a, I don't know if you know the, the film movie, the film model, but there's a, there's a guy named the director when they make a movie. And when they, when they cast for, for actors, the director has a very clear idea of the type of role, of the type of person that needs to fill that role. And I think we need to be as astute uh, when we, and, and, and I've moved uh, myself from calling, uh, calling uh, the activity prospecting to actually calling, calling in client selection. It's really Fantastic. client selection. It's, it's, you have to select the people you want to work with. Yeah. Great points, guys. Okay, so um, Claude, how do you manage a situation when CDVs vary amongst different stakeholders involved in the process? Mm, it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> and if, um, well, uh, I would, and I would assume here that the person is referring to multiple uh, influencers or decision makers in the, in the, in the decision making process. So, uh, it is, it is tougher to manage. Um, uh, and gee, I, I have, I have a, can, can I take ahead. that one? I have to kick that one around for a while. Can, yeah. can, I, can I take that one? Yep. Go, go. So you unite them in one single success story. So even if there's a lot of, of uh, different values by a bunch of different people, they all agree that the end success is it should be very, very similar. So the way that you want to do it is the hero, which is the company, has a common problem. And that problem might have different facets on, on a micro level, but on a macro level, it's most likely the same issue that they want to fix. And if you're able to put that into one single sentence, then you're able to grab, grab everyone together and yeah. then move them towards one, uh, one mission, one success. Great when answer, have, Ben. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so... Um, I'm going to paraphrase this question a little bit, but, the, but there's an issue here that the prospects are only focusing on the products um, yeah. and I cannot really make the point on value. Uh, I guess the, the conversation seems to be shutting down before that. So we have about 30 seconds left. I know that's pretty quick, uh, but if you can answer in that time, that'd be great. Well, I'll answer this. Uh, um, I got a call a few, uh, about six months ago, a lady calls in, she says, uh, my name is Angie from this company and I'm looking for a course on closing techniques. And I said, do you mind asking you, if I ask you a few questions? And she says, no, I don't wanna, I don't wanna talk to you. I, I don't wanna, I don't have time to waste. I, I just wanna, you know, how much does it cost? 
And I go, well, you, maybe we can have a conversation with you and your sales manager. And she says, no, 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 I want to, I, how much does it cost? And she was insisting and insisting about getting a price that, and, and a product. And my simple answer was, well, Angie, uh, it seems to me you're shopping for training the same way some people shop around for a pair of pants. So that's not the way we work. And uh, I'm sure somebody will out there will probably be a good partner for you, but I don't think we're a good fit. And I went on. And sometimes that's what you have to do. And I, I, I dare everyone on the call to, at, to walk away from at least one or two sales per quarter just, just because it's not a good fit. It's, I dare you guys to do that. It's, it's, uh, you have to do it. I have a five second answer to this. How much does a house cost? How much does a house cost? You know, you, you, you answer the question by, answer, by asking uh, another question. You know, it's, it depends. It, it really depends. Yeah. You know, a, a condo in Chateauguay doesn't cost the same thing as a mansion in Westmount. Fair. Nothing against Chateauguay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Property value. <laughs> you didn't make that up. Um, okay, I want to thank everyone who joined the session. Uh, and thanks, Claude and Ben, uh, for all, uh, all the work you did here. I think there's uh, some really great takeaways. Uh, just in terms of post, uh, you'll, shortly you'll be receiving an email uh, from us with a recording of the session, uh, the takeaway tools that were presented, and some of the articles and books suggestions as well. Um, you'll also be getting a feedback survey that we would really appreciate if you can complete. Uh, it helps us to understand what you're looking for in terms of learning uh, for future sessions and how we can improve. So um, definitely stay connected. If you have any questions at all that we didn't get to, feel free to send me an email, add me on LinkedIn, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, our next session is going to be next Friday, so May 15th with Jane Reitman Van Tosh. And she'll be giving us tools on how to manage ourselves during high stress situations. So have a really great weekend. Stay safe, everyone. And hopefully the snow goes away. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for attending.